The transition from the 60s to the 70s showed a clear and direct shift in the way that designs were handled. We saw these approaches change in every creative space, and watch design was no exception. When we look back at those designs of the time now, they make us question a lot of things, really ask why their motifs changed so radically. What was the purpose? Why was there a need for such a change? And whether or not some designs were pushed too far in a different direction? The Omega Speedmaster line shows a really clear development over time, originally beginning as a humble instrument to be used by racing professionals in the late 50s, competing with very notable names in the genre, before getting a facelift, beating its competitors and launching into the Earth's orbit. Notice the sheer amount of contrast between the late 50s model and an early 60s variant. It transitioned from being a casual wearing t-shirt and jeans watch into a qualified instrument. Using high contrasting paint, an excellent use of color and line weight between the batons, minute track and subdials, a matching tachymeter bezel, simplified pencil hands, the Speedmaster that we are all well aware of today took shape. Then, just in time for the watch to be the first on the moon, the Speedmaster was modified again. The case received an overhaul and for the first time was given the name Professional. That period of history has been photographed, bookmarked, making the watch as timeless as the event itself, and the Speedmaster became a household name. But what happened afterwards? Were there any further explorations? How did Omega transition their Speedmaster into the 1970s? After the moon landing, there were talks between Omega and NASA to continue making further improvements to the Speedmaster for the purpose of space exploration. To keep the work under wraps, especially from prying eyes of American-based watchmakers, they nicknamed the operation the Alaska Project, and Omega took this time, investing a lot of money into the project, to create a watch that would be extremely resilient to all forms of interferences and variations, while making the Speedmaster all the more practical to be worn outside of a spacesuit as an instrument. The case was honed from a steel block, following a never-before-seen method that would become extremely popular throughout the 70s. The term we often use today is monoblock case. They created a large anodized aluminium casing to cover the watch when the astronauts would suit up, and this casing is what really defined the Alaska Project model. Bright red with a contrasting white dial, it incorporated a new cam-operated chronograph movement and transformed into this hardcore utility that was made to be extremely legible, resilient to massive temperature fluctuations, and a watch worthy of being taken into the unknowns of space. Until NASA rejected the proposal, Stating the Speedmaster had been a watch that worked well and completed the moon mission successfully, so there was no need for further exploration into future developments if the first model performed flawlessly. So the amount of money, research and development just went to waste, or did it? 1969, the 70s were just around the corner, and Omega thought, if NASA and the professionals don't want an updated Speedmaster, we'll focus on the consumer market and gave the Speedmaster a facelift, in the form of the Speedmaster Mark II. At first, the real change was addressing the form of the case. That is the most defining feature, and using this new process of creating a streamlined form from a block of steel allowed them to follow with their monoblock approach that was first used with the Alaska prototypes. We see just how much more simple the watch looks in this configuration, how the tachymeter bezel has been placed inside the dial, and actually, with a simpler case, your attention is focused solely on the detail of the dial. It's as if the case and bracelet disappears when you try to read the watch, and that thought to streamline the case really had an impact on the Speedmaster. It looks fantastic. A designer's opinion, it looks like much more of a watch suited for space. It manages to retain its most important features, but looks simplified, more refined, Another bonus is that it looks more integrated. There are no divides between the case and the bracelet. The model has a great amount of visual presence. And we could all say it looks more natural, even more so like an instrument than before. The next phase is when the Mark II Speedmaster got exciting. The introduction of highlights and racing dials. We could coin the term racing dial with chronographs of the 70s, since movements were becoming more competent 
having higher beat rates. They were now able to accurately determine times to a sixth of a second and beyond. Of course, unless you are an avid race timing enthusiast, you'd never be that interested in calculating time to the millisecond, but the aesthetic of the racing dial allowed for all sorts of creative opportunities at the time. And they also just look terrific, very refined, expressive. They give a chronograph greater meaning and presence, showing off even more detail on the dials. Almost like how many enthusiasts appreciate rail dials on vintage watches, we could place racing dials in there somewhere as well. So the Mark II Speedmaster adopted funky orange highlights on the chronograph hand. The respective subdials that counted the minutes, hours of the chronograph also received the same treatment. The hour, minute and seconds hand remained white. But even the handsets changed. The orange chronograph hand is spare of detail, no loom plot, no signature Omega arrowhead. We see a balance between the loom plots and now orange highlights used to emphasize every five minute marker. Then the introduction of the highly detailed racing dial, the main variant using a solid scarlet ring to surround the minute track. The Mark II was a far cry from the original Speedmaster Professional. In recent years we have seen Omega revive the Mark II Speedmaster, adjusting the size, incorporating a different coaxial movement, a date complication at the 6 o'clock position. The model receives a faded grey colour scheme and bright orange highlights, as well as receiving a few more modern touches. But the real defining feature is the large case and integrated bracelet, expertly machined and finished. As for its styling, it gives off that 2001 A Space Odyssey effect. It's the type of watch that would align perfectly with the color palette of the film and would make for an absolutely brilliant prop in the movie. Just imagine how fitting it would have been. Correct for the time period of the late 60s, modern retro styling, a design that seems to transcend time in many ways. Imagine how much of a cult classic it would have become. Then it's questioning why this watch wasn't selected by NASA. We could be sure that these references would eventually move into being used widely by astronauts after the Alaska Project prototypes had seen their time. Maybe part of the reason was because of the movements being changed from 321s to 861s. Maybe it was just the dogmatic approach of using what works and not risking time and money for further development that could be considered unnecessary. Maybe it was just the thought of having to go through the process of testing these newer watches again that would cause more headaches and expense. Putting our enthusiasm aside, realistically, we have to remember that these are just watches, simple tools that tell the time. Surely there were more pressing issues to consider, and the style was not exactly essential. And it is actually such a shame that NASA weren't interested in moving with the times and adopting this second generation because speaking more to the actual functionality of the watch, it comes across as something much more practical for the purpose of being worn in harsh environments. The case being one piece could take a lot more impact. The bezel being hidden inside the dial is neat, making the watch appear cleaner. But also, the smooth surface of the piece would never hang up on clothing. It would be able to be worn more discreetly. All of these aspects, integrated braces included, would make the watch less prone to exterior mechanical failures. So it is open to debate as to why the Speedmaster Mark II was not and never has been anywhere near as successful as the Moon Watch. They are more interested in a watch that has triumphed in one way or another. And yes, we can all agree that maybe the Speedmaster Professional has aged much better with its case shape and aesthetics. It has received the most amount of attention, but is it the better designed watch of the two? For a civilian, it is a terrific watch, but as a tool, a utility for the purpose of space exploration, for example, there is something about the design of the Mark II that seems much more appropriate. It's less finicky, more streamlined, less prone to breaking. The integrated look seems to be a thing of the past, but we are seeing a resurgence from a few daring companies. We see how elements like racing dials are still very prominent with a lot of brands. So the Speedmaster Mark II shows a very peculiar but interesting history of development, rejection and revival. And of course, many renditions came after the establishment of this model, so we will discuss the Mark III, IV, 4, 4.5, 5 in a future series. Do we think then that the Mark II is a classic? Will it gain more attention in years to come? 
Maybe.